was telling Kay before I, we started the service talking, and I said, um, if you read the Puritans when they wrote, or they wrote their sermons, um, if you ever read the sermons of the Puritans, they could have eight or nine points, mountain of points and sub points to go along as well. Normally, people tell us we should have three points when you're preaching. That's what the, the, uh, the, the people who teach us to, or taught us and things of, of um, preaching and so forth, they'd say really three points are good. Well, this morning I've got a few more points than, than three points, to be honest. And um, I'll have to see how it goes. I, I'm not going to keep you here that long, so I, I've got to be away myself, so I won't keep you unless you brought your sandwiches and your whatever. But, um, so I'm just going to see how it goes. If I can get through everything, I will. If not, I'll just stop, even if it's in a position where it's not natural <coughs> to stop. It's because we're going to consider a miracle, which is um, a well-known miracle in the life of Elisha. It's probably the most well-known situation in the life of Elisha. We looked at a few miracles, which really were not that well-known, I would imagine, by, by many of us. But we're going to be thinking about certain things. Here's my points this morning. And this is where you're going to see how quick you're going to move through them. The person, the problem... God's providence, the prophet, pride, made pure, a new person. And there's some points to remember at the end of the service, isn't it? So we, we, they're all P's that'll help you a little bit if you've got a good memory. But that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. First of all, we're going to think about the person in the, in the, in the situation that we just read in, um, in 2 Kings. First of all, the person we're thinking about initially is a man called Naaman. He was, in some ways, a local hero. He was, in many ways... Uh, we would say the kind of a, a celebrity of, of his day. He was held in very high esteem by even the king of Syria, by many of the people in the land. So this is a man, this is a top man in Syria, which was one of the powerful um, countries of the day. He was a man who had been a man of valour. He was a man who had led probably many campaigns as a, as a captain. He, he was a great man held in high esteem by his master. He was an honourable man. Um, he, 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 he was known in the palace in the, in the high um, um, circles of, of his day. Um, but we are told, as of yet, he's still a pagan. He's, he's not a believer in the real God. And um, we're told that he'd had many victories. He'd, he'd won many battles, probably. But we're reminded, as we'll see later, that, that God is sovereign. God is in control of all things. We use a term in, in biblical language, providences. And we're going to see that very shortly, that God had his hand upon, upon this man. Because God works out his purposes. He works out his purposes in ordinary people, down to earth people. But even in the kings or the leaders of this world, even the wicked of this world, do you know what? God can use them. That's why we, we don't overly panic about Putin. We don't overly panic about the... Because we do believe actually God can use even the, the terrible things that happen in the world for his, for his glory. Now... God used Naaman to give victory over, over Israel because what would happen, the Assyrians would come and they'd attack the land and they'd, they'd rampage through the, through the cities and the towns and the villages. And really it was because Israel had sinned and God actually would take other nations to, to punish Israel for their sin. It's an Old Testament um, precedent that's been set. When they disobeyed God, God allowed other people to, to reign over them. So the people of God, Israel, had turned away from God. And later we find that he was a, a proud man. He was one who had the best in this life. He was a man of status, a man, a man of standing. And he would have been what we call a man's man. He wasn't some kind of wishy-washy. This was a, a man of valour. This was a soldier, a man who was a, who, who was, who was a strong character. But we see at the end of the verse that there was something wrong with this man. And it just reminds us that even the greatest, the most powerful, uh, are, are, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a time, we live in a, in a, in a life, which we're all, we're all sort of susceptible, we're all fickle. Our, in human existence, we, we're not going to be here forever. I always come, it always comes to my mind when I think of powerful men. I mean, I, I like boxing when I was younger, and um, it's probably still do, but, but Ali was a, a tremendous athlete, wasn't he? I mean, he had everything. He had the looks, he had the power, the skill. He was, he was not your running a mill boxer. And, and yet, we see the end of Ali's life. What a sad picture, wasn't it? He could hardly speak. He was, uh, with with, with um, the illness that came upon him, he could hardly walk. And he died relatively young. A man who was a powerful, called himself the greatest, didn't he? Well, when we look at the life in which people live, this was a man of standing, a man of, of, of position. And 
even the greatest men, even the aliens, uh, their, their lives are, are, are fickle. We don't know how long we're going to be here. And what would be the advantage of this man or any man having all the wealth that was possible, having everything at his disposal, and imagine there's no food, there's no water. What's the point in having all these things that we have? Can you imagine you've got everything? You've got a car, the best car you could have in your drive. You've got the best house. You've got the, the plush furniture. But you're bedridden. I mean, what's the point of it? What's, what's, what's it all about? What, do we, do, what can we do with it? If we have ill health and we're stuck in bed. More importantly, the scripture says this. What would it profit a man or a woman? What would it profit a man if he could gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? What profit is it? 70, 80 years. Controls the world and yet loses his soul. Comes under the condemnation of God. Naaman was in that position, a man of power, a man of position. So there's the person, if you want, the problem that he had next. He was a leper at the end of verse 1. Now suddenly that puts everything else into perspective, doesn't it? This was a man of wealth, a man of status, a man of position. Yet he had a problem, and the problem was leprosy. Now there are certain illnesses in our day that if someone tells us we've got that illness, it sends shudders to our body. Someone said we have cancer. If someone says we've got motor neuron, once you've been told that, that, that puts everything else into perspective, doesn't it? In our day, leprosy can actually be treated in, in it's still evident in parts of Africa and so forth. It can be treated, it can be taken care of. In, in Naaman's day, it was often seen as being terminal. If you had, if you had leprosy, that was, that was the end. It usually started with just a spot, and then it began taking over your body and flaking throughout your body. Verse 27 tells us something of the, the, the effect there it had upon him. It continues to spread through the body until the end it affects the nerve endings on your fingers, your toes, whatever. And that means that what actually happens is that if you've got, if you've got leprosy and things are beginning to progress, then the person, if they cut themselves, if they burn themselves, they, they don't actually know they've done it because there's no feeling in their fingers. Or their hands, and then they become septic, and, and that's usually the, 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 the way in which the, the person de de deteriorates. Now, there was much commendable about Naaman, but he also had a, a major problem. It was wreaking havoc in his body. He had this terrible disease, which was which was leprosy. In scripture, very often we could say leprosy would be a, a, a picture that we could use, or a, uh, an illustration that could be used of sin, isn't it? of uncleanliness. An illness which is spoken of in, in Leviticus chapter 13 and chapter 14, it, it speaks about, within Israel, they had, they, had a, they had a very strict regime with regard to people who caught leprosy. And they, they, they would have to deal with it. It would be recognized, and then it would be brought, they would be brought to the, actually brought to the priests. And the priests would diagnose and determine whether or not that person should actually have interaction with, with society. Because when it was diagnosed, it was monitored, and then eventually, if it was continuing to, to, to develop, they would be excommunicated from society. They would be put into quarantine, if you want. You were not allowed to go near someone who had, who had leprosy. It was felt it was contagious. It was felt that it was, it was something that was obviously, they, they felt even inherited. So you would be kind of ostracized. It reminds us a lot of COVID, doesn't it? I think what happened in, once you had COVID, oh, the panic, everybody kept away, you were locked away. And, it was similar to that in, in that particular age. So it displayed itself as an illness, which really displayed itself as an illness of shame in many ways. Now much could be done for such to be helped and to be, to be recognised in Jewish culture. But in the, in the culture of, of Assyria, they, they, they really didn't, didn't have any means of dealing with it. And they didn't really seem to ostracise people with it. They were not... They had no laws of how to quarantine someone if you had leprosy. So it was, it was approached differently than it would have been in Israel. But it reminds us that it's a picture of, of man standing, if you want, outside of the things of God. By nature, we're not actually clean in, in God's sight. Romans chapter 3 and verses 10 and 11 says this, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. 
Psalm chapter, I think it's Psalm 5 and verse 15, I, I believe. But the psalmist there turns around and he says this, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It wasn't sinful that she, she conceived him. It was the fact that it was in sin that the child was, was conceived. So we'd say this, just as the one man's sin entered the world and death, through sin and the death spread to all men. Why? Because all have sinned. So sin is like something which was, they, they thought in those days, it would be just inherited, something which was passed on. They've been doing the creation story with the children in school. So starting in, in the seven days, six creation, seven. And then I've gone then to explain why Adam and Eve had to leave the garden. And then I have to explain why are things like they are today? Well, it's because of sin. It's because of the fall. Just gone on to Cain and Abel. So we've had the first murder in the history of the world. A brother becomes jealous of his, of his brother and tries to worship God in a way which, which wasn't acceptable. So that's the state that man is in. Your iniquities, says Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins has hidden, has he hidden his face, he's hidden his face from you. Your sin has separated you from God and your sin has meant that God's had to hide his face from us. So you see, without healing, the leper was under well, judgment, you'd say. He was, going, he was going to die eventually. He was away from the, 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 people, the people that he had dealings with eventually. And because of sin, Adam and Eve, they cast out of the presence of God. They can't come into the presence of God in the Garden of Eden. So sin affects the whole of society. We know that leprosy, to them, seemed incurable. If it was left to themselves, it meant death. And left to ourselves in our natural state, actually, we're, we're incurable. We can't put ourselves right before God. And that's why Jesus came into the world. That's the whole point of the gospel. We cannot be made clean and right before God by our efforts. We, we just can't. And yet God sent his son into the world. Why? To cleanse us from the effect of sin. So, Naaman's plight, he was hopeless. He had a major problem. He was infected with leprosy. It was going to result in death. The Christian has come to that position to realize that once they were under condemnation, and now because of what Jesus has done, they've been able to be cleansed by faith in him. So there's the problem. Leprosy. There's a great man, the person, Naaman. In reality, we've got some great people, perhaps in our in our day, but without the grace of God, they've got a major problem. They're under the condemnation of God because sin is something which is inerrant. It's something that we actually are born with. Then we see God's providence. Now, when we think of providence, it's very often we've got to keep in mind the links. Things that happen in our lives. You ever look back on your life and thought, if I hadn't gone there, I hadn't done that, I hadn't met this person, life would have been so different. But you see, it's like as if there's little links in the chain, isn't it, along, along our lives. We get an insight into the dealings of God in the affairs of this world. Because we also see how he deals with individual lives. You see, God isn't a God who's not interested in humanity. He's not a God who's removed from this world. He's not a God who isn't interested in individuals. So the happenings, the actions of life, they have a purpose. We call it in the providence of God. God upholds this world of ours. He's concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. That's not outside of what God knows and what God is in control of. We can't always understand why things happen the way they do. But the God that we worship says this, I even know when a sparrow falls to the ground. I know everything there is to know, and I'm in control. So the silly problems that hit us in life, the frustrations, well, God is still in control. It's not about fate. We don't believe in luck. We believe in the providence working, the providence working of God. Now, many Christians will say this. They'll say, I believe in the sovereignty and the providence of God in my life. They say that, and self-included, and then something goes awry in our lives. And immediately it's, why has this happened to me? Why has this gone wrong in my life? And we begin to forget that actually God is in control 
He works out his purposes and providences in our lives. We can't always understand the purposes of God. But we know that he's in control. We know that he speaks to us and he actually uses links in the chain. You know, God knows the beginning. He knows when we come into this world. He knows actually when we exit the world. But he also, in between the, the entrance and the exit, there's all these links that God has that's going to be used in individual lives. God has purposes. So he's inserted certain things and certain people in our experience and in our lives. So they're links. Verse 2, Naaman tells us of his situation. Or verse 2 tells us of his situation. We're told there that there was one who was going to be a link who would be enabled to bring Naaman the cure that would be provided. Naaman was a great man, so-called. The person we're going to be introduced to is, is a nobody, a non-entity. But actually going to be a vital link in the life of this man. What actually happened was this. The, the Syrians, they, they would actually attack different parts of Israel. They, they would do what normally would take place in those days. They would rampage a village. They take everything from it of value. They kill many of the men as they could. They would then take some of the women or the girls, the kids away. They just drag them back to their own land. And I was quite, quite normal in that particular sphere of life. The next person we're thinking about is a person who in God's providence was going to be a vital link in the life of this man, Naaman. She was a young Jewish girl. We can't really begin to imagine. Now we talk about, you know, we, we doubt sometimes what God is doing in our lives. Can you imagine this young girl? She had witnessed something horrendous happened in her life. We're not told what. We can imagine it. And we've seen the films and the Vikings come into a village and they cause mayhem. Something like that, this, this girl would have experienced, perhaps her family was killed before her, we don't know, and the, the village was, 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 was ripped apart. And then she's dragged away as a young girl back to Syria. She had no idea what lay before her. She may be abused, she may be killed, she may be brought before a family who would treat her, treat her in a terrible way. <coughs> we don't even know the girl's name, so this is a non-entity if you want compared to Naaman. But she's one of the Lord's people. She was going to be a vital link in what God was going to use in the life of this man. She wouldn't, her name would not be remembered, but this girl, she has been preached on or related to for centuries, hasn't she? A non-entity, taken prisoner, and we're talking about her thousands of years later. She, it was seen, was a true believer in the true God of Israel. She must have learned much at home from her parents, from her people around her. The land wasn't in a very good spiritual state, but she knew enough about God to have trusted in him. It would seem even in the midst of her tragic circumstances, she never lost her trust in God. Now that takes some thinking, doesn't it? Can you imagine one of your daughters being dragged away to another land, but she hasn't lost her trust in God. Did she cry out, why me? Why is it me? Why did I have to go through all this, God? You've been so unfair. But what she kept her was that she trusted in the God she believed in. She must have understood something of what Joseph understood. We mentioned it Wednesday night. But Joseph understood when he was sold into Egypt by his brothers. He says at the end of the story, doesn't it? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God took your evil intentions to get rid of me to prepare for the family to be saved from starvation and for me to be the one who would be raised up into power in Egypt. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. She was raised as a link, this little girl. She was to be chosen in God's providence. She must have understood something of what the psalmist says in Psalm 31, verse 15. My times are in your hands. I don't understand why you allow this to happen. My times are in your hands. I wonder as the events began to unfold, perhaps she began to understand there was a purpose in God's allowing us to go forward in my life. And often we have to say we walk by faith, we don't walk by sight. We don't know why, we don't know how, and sometimes we just have to trust that God knows best. In actual fact, we try to understand these stories of the Old Testament, 
And Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 tells us these things were written for our learning, for our example. What was this thought about? It was to teach us certain things, to teach us that God has links in his providential dealings in lives. God had protected her. She could have been murdered. She could have been raped, left for dead. But God had a purpose. She brought her into this home, this comfortable home. It was a man of standing, remember, a, a person of, of position. But she was brought into this home for a purpose. Verses 2 to 4 there, she did not seem to hold a grudge. In fact, she sees the illness beginning to progress in her master. And what she does, she seeks the good of her master. We might have said, we'd be in the corner saying, you've got your come up on this. I saw you when you drove into our, rode into our village and the terrible things you did. Now you're getting your come up on this. Is that what she's like? She looks and she begins to probably think, you know, God's put me here for a purpose. It's a bit like Joseph in Potiphar's house and so forth. Became a man of standing in the house of a captain in Egypt. Obviously, eventually, she, he was wrongly accused of rape, put into prison. But even those things were all in God's hands. Verse 3, in times of trial, she, she still testified to the goodness of God. She knew where her hope was. She knew where her hope for her master was. It was only going to be found in the God of Israel. But she was going to speak of these things to her master. She was going to tell her master about her God. She quietly points him to the one who is the healer, not only of the body, but of the soul. It's called evangelism. That's, that's, what, that's the right term for it. If we want to speak about how do we tell people about the things of God. Evangelism isn't just getting somebody to preach and get in the corner and get them all into church. And evangelism isn't just pushing leaflets through um, letterboxes, hoping that people will come along to a service. That's all part of it. But our evangelism actually, I believe, starts with our lives. We have to be those who get alongside people and we're able to show that we're concerned about people and we're able to tell people about the things of God in a simple way as we relate to them God's goodness to us and can be to them this is what this girl is going to do she speaks of such things she's able to tell him the words are taken seriously by Naaman when she comes to Naaman's wife and tells him about the, 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 tells him about the, the God in Israel and even spoke of the in, in the corners of power that something is taking place in, in Israel that may be able to consider for the good of this man Naaman. The, the powers, the, the king gets the message, the man of the of the hour. Even what this little girl had talked about floats through to the powers of corridors of power in the palace. It is interesting, I mean, we, I don't know if you ever knew much about um, Ian Paisley. Now, he wasn't presented with the most, um, <laughs> the best sort of um, publicity. He was a powerful man, he had a lot to say, he was very, actually, from people who knew him, and, and I've heard much reports of, the people in Parliament took, had a great deal of respect for, for Paisley, for what he, what he stood for. And, and he was obviously a man who worked very well in the community for Catholic, and for Protestants, the Catholics in, in, um, in Belfast and all, they, they thought highly of Paisley. So he's moving in the powers, in, in the corridors of power. Billy Graham, I, I read a bit about Billy Graham recently, and they tell us that Billy Graham actually had dealings with every one of the presidents in his era. He, he, he was invited to the White House to, 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 lend, to lend a ear and to listen, or for them to listen to what he had to say. So there may be men we, we wholeheartedly agree with, but they had influence in corridors of power. This little girl was actually getting things through to the corridors of power of, of Syria. They, they hear about what she's been talking about. A little word from a little maid becomes a link in the progress of God's word. Promises. She, she, she could speak about her God. She would love her neighbour as herself. She'd love her God. Here she is. She even loves her enemies. The man who dragged her off or was involved with her being dragged off. The problem, we all see people in difficulties and problems. The difficulty is they, they seem to look in the wrong places, don't they? 
it's at the bottom or it's a, 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 a needle or what have you, they, they, they look for answers to meaning and purpose. We see that what, what providence has worked out for good here. The king seeks the, the, the aid, obviously, he wanted help. He thinks that actually I could purchase help. I, I'll, I'll get together some, some, some means whereby we can actually support Naaman in his situation. So the king thinks that he can, he can do something well. He can, he can write to the king of Israel. And that's surely where all these things need to be dealt with. Like the wise men who came from the east. Where do they go first of all? Well, well, well they, go, they go to the to king Herod, don't they? That's surely the place. So he writes a letter to the king of Israel. The king sends this letter in verse 5. Also he's going to send a, a huge amount of wealth in verse 6. And the letter, when the king receives it, nearly blew his mind. Because remember, Syria is the power. Verse 7. The king of Israel should have known of Elisha. Should have known what Elisha was able to do. What does he do in panic? He tears his clothes in, in remorse. He says, the king of Syria, he's making such demands on me that I can heal his captain. How can I heal a captain? What he's doing, he's sending me this letter to make an excuse to come and invade our land again. Well, how can I heal a leper? The king should have known it was God's man in the land. There was one to whom he could turn. So we find that such situations were actually in the hand of God. He hadn't given up on this man. The chain, the extent of the links now were beginning to, to, to go on. The king in despair and Elisha hears about it. So he comes and speaks to the king. Elisha's got the king's ear and he goes to the king. He hears of the king's unofficial mourning. And we find that he goes and he speaks to the king. This mighty man of power who is now panicking. The simple faith of a little girl has been affected now within the captain's house, within the palace of Syria, and also now within the king's palace in, in, in Israel. The girl must have thought this. She must have thought, if I, if I tell him that the prophet in Israel can heal the captain, and he goes on a wild goose chase, and I'm finished. So you see how much faith this little girl must have had. Anyway, verse 8, we find that he says, they send him to, to me, the king. He says to the king, if you send Naaman to me, as Elisha says, then I will show him there is a prophet in Israel. If he comes to me, I will prove there is a God with whom we can do. You see, the links were in place to provide for this man. He was beginning to realize there was only hope found in the God of Israel. Bring him to realize the only hope of removing this terrible illness, this terrible um, situation he was in, was found in God himself. When we think of the Christian message, what we say is this. There is no hope for any person before God except in Jesus Christ. By nature, we're away from God. By nature, we have no hope in the presence of God because we've inherited sin. We will, by nature, we are sinners. And yet the wonderful thing is, God has provided a means whereby we can be cleansed. We can be made right. And what he's done in people's lives, he's brought people across our paths he brought things that can help to guide us in the right direction to see that there's a one in whom we can trust, one in whom we can know forgiveness, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So the person, well, the person, he was a very important man. But he was a man. The problem, he didn't have leprosy. There's some very important people about, but they're just human beings like us. And it's the same problem as we have. By nature and by practice, so very far from God. That's the problem. Sin, the fact is that God in his wisdom, has, in his providence, brings people across our paths, gives us opportunities to see that God is in control and also that God can deal with our sin. And that's found in Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, it was, eight, it was seven or eight points. I could go on, I could finish the lot, but you have 
few weeks doing clubs, so I'll probably stop there. But it's worth remembering that in all the events of life, we're just links. So God knows the beginning, God determines the end, and in the middle, there are links that he's brought across our lives for a purpose. And the fact that we've come to expose ourselves to the Christian message means that God in his mercy has shown us as a way whereby we can be accepted before God by faith in Jesus Christ to cleanse us from our sins. We'll see what happens later. I'll, um, I'm not here next Sunday, so it'll be the Sunday after. But we'll continue to see what was the result of that great event there. Let's close our service and sing together the, the hymn that we're going to sing, which is In Loving Kindness. situations across our path which would cause us to turn to you. We pray that each one of us will know that in our lives what it is to trust in you for forgiveness of sins in and through your Son and our Saviour Jesus Christ. We ask as we go our separate ways you'll go with us, you'll bless us and you'll keep us. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.